tiny little overlap, but mostly it is uh, pretty disjoint. And yes, we can see that there's this new law in um, the European Union, um, like it's still under discussion, but it seems pretty finalized. It's called Mika, uh, highlighted here in purple, markets and crypto assets, and it's regulating markets and crypto assets. And in there is this cool definition. So a distributed ledger technology. So we would, we would call it like blockchain, but blockchain is a bit more specific. Distributed ledger technology is like a more generic term or DLT it means a type of technology that su supports the recorded, the, the distributed recording of encrypted data. So when I read this, I was like this because on the blockchain, you don't really do encryption. So if we uh, look at the definition of encryption, so this is from Wikipedia, the free encyclopedia. Encryption is uh, turning plain text into ciphertext. And there isn't really ciphertext on the blockchain, right? Like you encrypt something and then you decrypt something. You don't really ever decrypt something on Bitcoin. Um, or is it, I mean, I, unless we agree with Michael Saylor that Bitcoin is encrypted energy or something, which, uh, <laughs> which is technically incorrect and probably incorrect in many other ways too. <laughs> All right, so nothing in Bitcoin, nothing is encrypted on Bitcoin. We got um, signatures, we got hashes, and you know we got verifications and so forth. And you know, so yeah, th those are those are the great definitions by our great overlords. But here, I think it gets a little bit more uh, uh, controversial, which is good. That's why we're here. So this term, crypto asset ownership. So uh, like crypto asset, that immediately is uh, is for me like no. Crypto asset, that's like a little bit stretching, like it goes a little bit too far in regulated territory. And uh, even ownership, right? So like, um, you know, I just picked some article in there and like, it's talking about like safeguarding to ensure the ownership of the, like the ownership rights of clients of, you know, these crypto assets. However, you cannot own Bitcoin, right? Like Bitcoin, it's not something that like a law, there's no like ownership rights that are like attached to you as a person or something. And you might say, oh, what, what, what? Like this might get people a little bit like, you know, in, in the mood. Of course I can Bitcoin, I have them right on my phone and so forth. However, like here's the, here's the, the following is sufficient for spending Bitcoin, UTXO. UTXO is whatever is on the blockchain. Like we would call these coins, right? Uh, there, there are what, what are, on the blockchain for you to spend, right? unspend transaction output. So once you spend them, they're no longer spent. They contain transaction ID, output index, amount, the scripts, all of these things. First of all, um, these are all numbers. I mean, scripts technically is a program, but like the only thing you really care about is uh, the number in the address. Second of all of that is public information, right? So how can you really make an ownership claim about something that's uh, public and that was smooth. Second of, uh, third of, third of all, uh, yeah, and therefore you can't really make an uh, ownership claim on a UTXO. The second one is a private key. And I could say, oh, I own the private key, but well, a private key is just a number. Can you own a number? Like anyone who knows who who owns the number five? Like uh, yes, that's correct. Yeah, exactly. That's true. No, you cannot own a number, and there's actually a bunch of. Uh, <laughs> So, I mean, maybe you have to pay royalties to uh, him now, because I don't think anyone claimed the number five yet, so he might be like first use. Anyway, no, you cannot own a number, like can't claim a, like property right ownership of a number. Um, yeah, and therefore we cannot make a ownership claim on a private key. Um, yes, but, you know, when I went last time to Mallorca to the Bitcoin, no, the Maloka blockchain days, they were all talking about like, oh, finally, um, you can own your Bitcoin. Like it, it's true private property. You know, like it's something that uh, you really truly can own. Um, yes, and you know, other people might object and like, what to be us? Um, what about copyright law, right? Because you know, you can copyright things. I when I write a book, that is under my copyright. Um, and you know, for that is really relative simple and that is established as a precedent. A random key is not creative works because like it's literally the opposite of creative works. Like it's the least creative you can be. It's just like random, random noise. Therefore, that is not uh, like intellectual property. So, um, so therefore we can conclude Bitcoin is not property. Uh, it is something new. And most importantly, it doesn't fit into existing legal structures. And that is a big problem, of course, because, um, you know, the government needs to enforce things. 
and they're very, very slow. Therefore, um, like there's going to be mismatches. And yes, and Bitcoin in some sense is its own law, right? Like the law is written by um, the like by GitHub, I guess, right? Like the uh, it's it's um, it's software at the end of the day. But the dispute re resolution is not done by that. The dispute resolution is done by proof of work at the end of the day, like whichever has the longest, like you know, the most accumulated proof of work, like the, the longest chain, basically. Um, that is basically the outcome we accept. And, you know, the rules are actually quite strict. Like, you know, I cannot steal Craig Wright's coins, right? Like I have to, um, I have to have the private key in order to move them somewhere else. So, um, and fingers crossed, courts will hopefully not force miners to comply with their ruling. Why do I say that? Because you can like technically, legally steal crypto, right? Like you steal the private key or something, and then you move them over to your place. But what never happens, at least until now, I think it'll take a very, very long time, very long time until that happens on Bitcoin, and hopefully forever, um, is that they will be like, oh no, like that transaction is illegitimate. Please, Bitcoin developers, revert that, right? Like remove that transaction from the blockchain. No, you can do it, right? Like you make up the rules. Um, yeah, of course, there's going to be incredibly hard to enforce because uh, crypto is uh, enforced by miners. So you actually have to force miners to run that. And let's see, like, it's still like, it's an un un unanswered question. Can the government actually force miners to run a specific kind of code? Hello, Shamar. So here's this handy chart, a little bit, uh, you know, angled slightly. So there's more space for another Venn diagram circle. And we got what Bitcoiners think Bitcoin is. So what has happened is that uh, there's a big overlap there. And where most people actually build is in this area where like this big overlap is. For example, Coinbase, right? Like they're like, okay, you know, we need a custodian. We need something which like looks very similar to the existing uh, banking, right? We got all of these different things which are like in this nice space where like both regulators and you know bitcoin bitcoiners agree what it is however i'm different i want to build here i want to build there where um you know there's still a lot of empty space a lot of entrepreneurial um possibilities a lot of like room to do what we want um and yeah so i mean now let's redefine some terms then, I guess. So um, instead of saying owning Bitcoin, you can say control Bitcoin, because, you know, like ownership means exclusive control of Bitcoin. But, you know, like if someone randomly guesses your private key, then they also control Bitcoin and then it's no longer exclusive control. 50 BTC to me, so I should say send 50 BTC to my address, right? That implies that no, it's not going to, it's not going to me, it's going to you know, an address where I control the private key. And then thirdly, instead of saying hold Bitcoin, we should say hold Bitcoin hostage, right? Because like they're locked up in UTXO and you need to provide a, a in order to. Hmm? Yeah. yeah. All right. So now I have to keep time somehow else or uh, what time is it? 15 minutes in. Oh, it might be going a little bit too fast, but yeah, more for Q&A. So here's a quote from the Bible. I'm not sure if that applies. Uh, Storage treasures in heaven, whatever heaven here might mean, where moths and rust cannot destroy and thieves cannot break in and steal. Um, yeah, anyway, let me move on. So you might object, but to be us, even if that is true, the government doesn't care. Obviously, they don't care. Like if we say, oh, you know, like say you stole a whole like stole a whole bunch of Bitcoin from like guessing or like stealing or like finding someone's private key and then you move them all to your wallet, the government will say no. Like you have to return those. Obviously, right? Like they are um, they are yours. And also, like if you do you know some kind of exchange. Uh, custodial exchange and you could say oh no I, I don't I don't own them like they're just in my private queue and so forth of course the government does not care right like and you know that that is the truth and that to live in and I think the biggest thing there we have to play by the rules right so what I, what, what I wanted to say is that like we um 
and like there's this big dis discrepancy what bit, uh, bitcoiners think bitcoin is and what regulators uh, know what what bitcoiners think what regulators think bitcoin is and what bitcoin actually is so we kind of have to give the government like a um you know like we have to be a little like giving to them like yeah okay like it's difficult like this is a this is, it's a difficult thing like we don't we don't actually know what this new technology is that we discovered like it kind of is outside of the um, like it is kind of outside of the law, right? Like we, it has its own rules, has its own mechanisms. There's, there's not really like a court order can't really change the, the the blockchain and so forth. But there's still uh, guidance, and you can still go to jail, which uh, I will, uh, which I demonstrated in the first slide, no, second slide technically. And luckily, the U.S. government. The uh, FinCEN. By the way, I, I kind of like the uh, the logo of uh, FinCEN. Like it has the um, the eagle, like the some institutional stuff, like the cool globe. I'm not sure if that's a little bit too um, too reaching because apparently it's just for um, America. But the nexus is, you know, maybe the nexus goes a little beyond that. And also we got like in binary. Uh, I had actually decoded that, and it says FinCEN. Right, like the first two are capital F. After that, lowercase i and so forth. So yeah, I, I, I got to hand it to them. That's a, that's a pretty cool logo for a government bureaucracy. So, and not only do they have a cool logo, they are so kind to tell us what we can do, like pretty explicitly. And it written in human language, so not like this legalese that nobody can read. This is written for someone who, I don't know, like I don't know, can read good books that like might, might be a little bit more complicated than you know a comic, but yeah. And you can find them under that address. And... I mean, the screenshot just continues, so that is literally the next thing there um, from that PDF. The two things to watch out for is uh, money service businesses. So, uh, like they are saying, okay, these re regulations relate to money service businesses, and specifically the uh, the the task is money transmission. So, it might be a little complicated. So here's a handy chart. So this is if you do comply. This is if you don't comply. So what you do is you do money transmission. And if you don't comply, you do money laundering. If you, what you are, if you, if you do comply, you are a money service business, MSP. I, I, I might refer to those as MSP, and like virtually everyone refers to them in MSP in that space. If you don't comply, you're an unlicensed money transmission business. What you have to do, you have to do KYC and AML. And that is actually quite strict, right? Like uh, Anybody who signed up for exchanges, it takes a while because they have to approve you, they have to check your ID and so forth. Some some places are really quick; they just like go through a database and so forth. But it ties it ties your identity to your coins, and it just removes all privacy basically. And I mean that's the whole goal. Um, what you have to do if you don't comply is you have to go to jail for up to five years. Yes, and here's the here's the law that uh, defines that. Whoever knowingly conducts blah 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 blah. An unlicensed money transmission transmitting business shall be fined in accordance with this title or imprisoned not more than five years. So, you know, five years at most. But we can see with the uh, can we see that here? Yeah, we can see that here. So um, this is this is a photo from uh, Bitcoin Embassy in New Hampshire, where apparently um, you know, people like Ian Friedman and some others have done um, money laundering according to according to the government. Uh, Ian Friedman is now apparently like his uh, sentence will be 420 years, which is a very auspicious number, but uh, that is quite a long time. 420 years, I do not want to serve 420 years in prison. And um, yeah, so you know, let's try to avoid, avoid that. So do miners have to go to jail, basically? Uh, and the truth is, no, Bitcoin is not an MSB. Like Bitcoin mining is not an MSB. And it's actually, uh, like, I mean, we can see here, like an MSP relates to financial institutions, but Bitcoin is like explicitly about sending money from one party to another without a financial institution, without any intermediary. Um, yes, and Bitcoin actually, uh, and interestingly enough, like uh, the FinCEN paper doesn't mention Bitcoin mining per se, because uh, it is actually very, very hard for the government under existing laws um, so maybe I need to clarify, like FinCEN guidance, it's not an, it's not issuing any new laws. It's just like giving, hey, given our current laws, giving our current money transmitting laws, this is what you have to do as a, um, as a business. And in, um, in the FinCEN guidance on mining, and this one is on mining pools and cloud mining, 
uh, they are saying if you distribute coins after they got mined, you do not qualify as, as money transmission. Um, and uh, the same is uh, true, I suppose. They're not clear on that, but um, it's very, very hard to make the argument. Because at the end of the day, if you are uh, mining, you're either just like downloading a piece of data, which is a transaction. You're looking if like signatures check out, also not money transmission. And you're like computing a Merkle tree of those and solving a uh, like a computation intensive hash puzzle. And all of those are not um, like each of those individually and combined is not money transmission. It seems so. Um, I mean, you know, I, I'll, I'll get to this, I'll get to disclaimer, but you know, do your own research. You know, I'm I'm showing slides, right? Like, um, I'm not a lawyer. I'm a developer. I'm just like giving you a mental mindset of how to apply these things so we can you know, thrive. Uh, now, unfortunately, we got some bad news and cue a hall of the mountain king because um, selling crypto online and even in person if you do it regularly is money service business and they call them p2p exchangers so if you go to someone and say like hey i want to trade crypto for cash then that technically is msp of course you don't do it in, if you do it infrequently so if i like you know do it just occasionally whatever that means not msp but you know they're going to interpret that as they want so uh, P2P exchanges my services online or may arrange to meet prospective customers in person, right? Um, a natural person operating a P2P exchanger that engages in money transmission services must comply with BSA regulations as money transmitter. Oh yeah, um, what I forgot to explain, there's this term CVC and that basically means crypto. They are not, they're not using the term crypto, they're using the term convertible virtual currencies because that actually also applies to like uh, World of Warcraft money, right? Like uh, they have they have the same thing uh, there, um, and so they just you reuse that term. Yes, more brand new ATMs are also MSP. Why? Mm, because like I mean, they say, an owner operating kiosk qualifies as money transmitter. All right, another rotation. Does it work? Yes. Um, because basically the way they define money transmitter is where you move uh, CVC from one person to another person or place, right? So um, the way they're saying is, okay, you have the cash and you're transferring that using the ATM from one person, which is the customer, to another. It's not another person because it's still the same person, but it's another place because now the cash is no longer in at the customer like in, in, in like the money is no longer in cash but it is now in a uh, UTXO it is now in a Bitcoin account, in a CVC account like in a in a Bitcoin address now the money moved from cash to Bitcoin address and uh, yeah that that is why um, we got really cool AML and uh, KYC um, like ATMs and general bytes, I think they make one, as far as I know, they make the best ATMs for crypto that we have. And they pride themselves, and you know, rightly so, with that general bytes is the only manufacturer flexible enough to accommodate even the tightest AML and KYC regulations. And you know, of course, they're just reacting to market demand, but uh, they can they can do many things. They can do they can read fingerprints, cell phone number verification, ID scan, selfie verification. And so forth to um, to do like cash limits or whatever, and uh, yeah, and you know th that is just like a direct result of these laws. And if you think about it, like moving cash from fr from one place to another, like do you really move the cash onto the blockchain? Uh, like it's a little bit hard to wrap our, our mind around, but that is how the laws work. So we got even more bad news. So crypto payment processes are also MSP, and they're like quite mischievous about that. Um, because there's an exemption for payment processes. Payment processes are not money transmitter, except for crypto, right? Because why not? Why wouldn't you just make an exception of the exception for crypto? Um, because they do not require, they do not satisfy all the required conditions for the exemptions. And there you basically, basically they say, okay, if you want to be like following those exemptions, you have to be in a, a between banks, basically. Like you have to be in a regulated. Uh, space and that does not it's not the case for crypto unfortunately so 
you can see that with coin payments, that's actually the, um, the website we're using um, for processing the uh, payments for the electronic cash conference. And I had to do KYC in order to use uh, coin payments, right? So yeah, unfortunately, all your payments or everybody who paid in crypto, they're attached at least to my name, which, you know, like, you know, that's just what, uh, like, that's just how the world is. But if I, ha if I had not used coin payments, if I had just put up my address there or like a BIP70 thing or whatever, then would, I wouldn't really be processing payments. I would just like accept payments. And yeah, you, we'll, we'll get to that in a little bit. So even more bad news. Like, uh, I mean, at some point we'll run out of them. I promise, I promise. So coin mixing services are also nice. I mean, yeah, the whole point of coin mixing services is like to clean your coins and if you like, clean coins and like that's kind of like you know you could say it's laundering right and so anonymizing services are actually money transmitters uh, so if you if you run a mixer for uh, crypto please KYC every person who's uh, like using the inputs of course yes no like the issue is that uh, yeah we, we that those are the results we get we um, Tornado cash developers arrest in the Netherlands. That is not like this is different law. So this is a Netherlands law, but you know they have overlap. Uh, and you know, Amory can go into detail there. He went yesterday, but we also got like uh, Bitcoin fork. Like that was uh, one pretty much one no one year and a half ago roughly. And um, yeah, and then the other feds arrested someone for money laundering, and they did the same thing. They ran a Bitcoin mixer because um, you are an anonymizing services provider. So, however, and I think I mentioned that. Yes, in there is an exemption. And we talked about that a little bit. Uh, cash fusion is very differently. Cash fusion is very different from Tornado Cash because cash fusion is just a piece of software. The, um, there's a server. So you could say, okay, that's the, that's the like services provider, but the server never constructs constructs a transaction. They are just facilitating data transfer, right? You're like, okay, and that is uh, exempt. Like, if you um, if you facilitate just the um, transfer of data, then you don't have to worry about that. So, if you guys are interested in privacy for Bitcoin Cash or eCash, um, it seems, and of course, this is not legal advice, but you know, you can do your own research. I'm, you know, I'm showing slides, getting you inspired. It seems like cash fusion it, it does not suffer um, the same status as uh, tornado cash, and we can actually go into that into the quote unquote really bad news is that Ethereum smart contracts, uh, according to the government, are MSP. So that is not really bad because, like, if you make a Ethereum smart contract like tornado cash, the way the government views it is that you deposit your coins into the app and you could say okay well but it's decentralized and everything however they view d apps the same way they view atms right it's just a machine where you throw in your thing it does some things and then at some point something else comes out right and um that of course is bad and unfortunately tornado if tornado .cash falls into that same category they are um basically an quote unquote atm for um for crypto, right? And therefore, whoever is the owner, operator of the DApp or both will be held uh, accountable. And like in, in the case of Tornado Cash, of course, it's a bit more, uh, more complicated because like there's a mixture of Netherlands law and then uh, US law and so, uh, and so forth. But, you know, keep that in mind. Um, and, you know, here's an example. <laughs> We can actually, uh, like, there's compliance to DeFi. So we thought, okay, DeFi, it means decentralized finance. Therefore, we don't have to be a, a money service business. We don't have to be a financial institution. But no, DeFi, apparently, uh, people are now starting to uh, get, a, uh, get registered as a money service business. So there's time chain. I haven't really heard of them, but, you know, I talk to people in person who are also working on things that are, like, regulatory licensed um like DeFi or like texas and so forth and uh you know there's a project that's doing that of course i'm like you know what's the whole point if uh you do a dex that is then also a, a money service business where you have to do a kyc and everything and of course you, you could argue that um 
oh, what you still get is like they can't like steal your coins because like you have your private keys and so forth. But you know, like, I mean, then you still have to do the KYC and so forth. So I'm I'm not I'm not really convinced of that. So is there no way out? I think there is. The answer is don't be an MSP. Ha! Huh. Problem solved, of course. Um, and what's coming next? Of course, a disclaimer, this is not legal advice. I'm just presenting screenshots and making breathing noises. And if you want to do that, please consult a lawyer if you want to do build a business based on the info provided here. Yes, I read that. I, that's a, there's an error in there. Anyway. So, now, how do we stay outside of MSB world? We don't want to be in MSB world. Um, so, we got, they are establishing three categories. They're establishing exchangers, administrators, and users. Exchangers, so this is the highlighted text, exchangers and administrators generally qualify as money transmitters under the BSA, while users do not, right? So, exchangers are money transmitters, administrators are money transmitters users are not money transmitters so a user is a person that obtains virtual currency to purchase uh, goods or services on the user's own behalf right like the user is like saying okay i got these coins here let me buy something there and that makes sense like if you go to a barber and he's like you know do you want to cut your hair and you say yes he's not coming all right can you please fill out this uh, kyc form i need to know who you are and need to check ID and so forth. No, that does not happen because uh, if you buy something for cash, then uh, like a barber is not a money service business. So, uh, and you know, if you use cash to buy there, then you're also not a uh, money transmitter. So yeah, and that is the most, uh, most important part in there on the user's own behalf. So if you keep that in mind, if that is like your mantra for building businesses on crypto, then you'll be good. Of course, you know, consult a lawyer because it's very hard to establish what is actually on a user's own behalf. But like that should be, should be the mindset. And curiously enough, uh, as I said, cash fusion is uh, different. Cash fusion actually, um, the way the way you know, again, not legal advice. <laughs> the way it seems is that um, the users are doing these transactions themselves, right? Like they're like, oh, you know, I'm just using this as a tool for me to use to to uh, like transfer money from me to somewhere else and uh, the server you know is just facilitating data transfer so another good news wallets are not msb um in the case of they, they call them unhosted wallets but in my view if you have a wallet that's custodial that's no longer a wallet right like if i have a piece of thing where like the government can just like remove coins from my uh, pocket then it stops being a wallet and like unhosted kind of sounds like almost derogatory but you know those are the terms they use so in the case of unhosted wallets uh, the property is stored in a wallet while the owner uh, interacts with the payment system directly and has total independent control over the value um, yeah so basically they're in fully in charge of their of their crypto uh, conducting a transaction through the unhosted wallet uh, to purchase goods and services on the users on behalf so that's the same phrase but in a different context they are not money transmitters so if you use a wallet you're not money transmitter hooray yes that is good and again the important part is total independent control you want to have the user should have total independent control and they should use the thing to purchase goods or services on the user's own behalf so some examples right like okay you could be like hey well, like all these things that you mentioned before they are all uh, money service business and that is bad but here we got something that is not money service business again you know not legal advice but it seems like it's not uh, money transmission business um so this is a protocol you know introduced by Vinamani, and basically you like signal on the chain that you have some utxos another guy's like oh that sounds good they partially they construct a partially signed transaction send it over, over to the other guy he fully signs that and then you facilitate it a swap right we here we got SLP dex works very similar um i'm um, no promises but there seems someone interested in rebooting that that's actually quite an old project uh, of mine and again there like you publish um, a like you lock up your coins somewhere and then someone else can like uh, complete 
the transaction to do the swap. And I mean, here's how it works a little bit technical, more technically. So this is a screenshot in the middle from the white paper. This is how Bitcoin transactions work. You got inputs and you got outputs. So Alice puts in 1 million uh, eCash. And then uh, Bob puts into, I don't know, Grumpy tokens or whatever. And then the outputs, you can see um, the, same, the same quantities went in, but the outputs are swapped. So um, the address of Alice now uh, gets moved, like they get two grumpy tokens and Bob gets 1 million eCash. Uh, yes, and effectively they've swapped their two, uh, like they've, they've, they've swapped 1 million eCash for two grumpy. However, since this is one atomic transaction, and you know Bob signed his part, Alice signed his part. It's kind of like they're just uh, moving coins over, right? They're just like uh, swapping these tokens out. And I have to say this is not explicit in the um, in the FinCEN regulations. Uh, like this is not explicitly exempt, but from what we can read in the text, um, if you like dig into it, um, there is exemptions for these uh, because there's no custodian, right? Like. Nobody here, like it just moves atomically from one place to another and from one place to another. There's no, uh, there's no intermediary. Yes, so, and we got uh, cash tap, right? It is, like it, it says it right there. It says non-custodial web wallet. So cash tap is not a money transmission. And you can actually have the, like you can just install the code, download the code and run it for yourself. Um, again, you have, I mean, in this case, you have even more control because you can run it on your own uh, hardware. So you have total independent control to purchase goods or services on the user's own behalf. Now, Bcash. Bcash is a project of mine. And here, I think it gets really interesting. Oh, it's the next slide here. Oh, no, it's a little bit too dark. Um, these cards, they are basically a plastic wallet. They are a piece of plastic that has a private key on there, generated by the card actually, I mean, that's how it works. And it can sign signatures so the merchant can build a transaction to redeem uh, some tokens. And the thing there is, this, like it feels for the user very much like a, a credit card or like a card that they can use, like a EC card here in Europe. But, uh, so memetically it's very similar, but the way it works uh, regulatorily, um you like there um it is it is just a piece of hardware right it's like a hardware wallet a hardware wallet is not msb um therefore like we can occupy the same like idea as a as, as financial institutions already have but without uh being a money service business right and so here, here we can say how it works um you know this the giant long uh smart contract that enforces all of these uh, and we get all of these things, right? So uh, a user is used to card payments. This is a screenshot from a presentation I've made earlier once. We, we get par card payments, we get offline payments. We get something that feels like an account, right? It's not quite an account, uh, but it's very similar. If we, if we use a stable coin, we get the unit of account where $1 equals one. Um, and actually the way it works is that the user doesn't pay the fee, the merchant pays the fee. And also there's recurrent payments attached there. So, um, I mean, this is from Bitcoin Cash days. So on Bitcoin Cash or an eCash, the customer pays the fee. Arguably, it's very low, but like it's, there's a mental shift there, right? right? Why, why, why would the uh, customer pay when he goes to a merchant? In uh, Bcash, the merchant pays the fee. Um, and, you know, the Bcash smart contract, you can either uh, redeem using a card payment or a phone payment, like doesn't matter, or uh, you can construct a transaction like anyone can construct a transaction to redeem a recurrent payment, for example, every week or so, um, and you know, return that to, like for example, for the subscription service, this would be interesting. Yes, and all of that is since like the user, like he, like it's his smart currency, it's attached to just him, like he is the person, it's you near know, like his own wallet, his own um, software that he is interacting with, that he is signing transactions for. Again, Total independent control. The user of Bcash has total independent control and they can do what they can do is purchase goods or services on the user's own behalf. Here's another example, Box. So Box, I think is this big um, innovation in my way. This is a little bit of a big, a little bit of a breakthrough. So the way it works is uh, it's an onboarding tool. An onboarding tool where you don't 
have to do KYC because the big issue is like if you go into a store and you want to be like, hey, I want to buy crypto, they're MSB, right? As we saw previously, they're called P2P exchangers. P2P exchangers, and they're also um, all kinds of other exchanges because you move the money, let's say cash, from cash into crypto. And that is from one place, from one person to another place. Um, Yes, so the way it works is you enter your address in there, like here, enter your address, there will be tokens too. This must be an address that where you control the private key for. Then, you know, he sends you a fancy code, and this code allows you to interact with the blockchain. Uh, here's, the, here's the blockchain, so there's this mint button, and with the mint button, we can generate new bucks. So we can see on the bottom of output number one, so that's the one with the e-token QP3, the money went to an address where it controlled the private key, and the mint button is returned to the exact same address. Right, you can see the address of the mint button is that address, and in the output is again the same address. And all of that is done through a smart contract on um, on uh, in, in in the mint button. And that way, um, I minted these tokens. And what I used, I used this. Um, code, of course, like this is all handled relatively transparently, so I actually never use this code. Uh, it's like just part of the URL params, basically. Um, yes, another example. This is outside of crypto. Ghost guns are 100% legal at the moment in most states. So again, not not legal advice. Um, and why? Because like basically, we, it's the same thing, right? Basically, crypto is a ghost gun. You are exempt from um, all, all of the like firearms uh, laws and so forth, because at the end, what you're doing is you're taking a piece of metal and you're like C CMC, like you're, you're carving something out. And then you're also buying parts that are like just available on the market. And it's the same thing with crypto. You know, you're just like C CMCing your own uh, private key or something. You're like, uh, you're, you're just doing things that look very similar to what existing uh, businesses do and uh, you are exempt. And actually the same case with Uber, right? Uber fills the same uh, idea. They look like a taxi business, ta taxi service business, but they actually um, are not. They are just a ride sharing business. And you know, it's the same, it's the same thing that we want to occupy. Actually what, like, so this is Cody Wilson, a very interesting speech on uh, po post-political, like that's his, that's his thing. So we shouldn't do political action, we should just build something. Um, and there he kind of gives like some ideas how we can do that. And he actually goes beyond. So what, what, what I'm saying here is, you know, like use, like here the rules play within those. And he's like, no, no, take the rules and play with the rules themselves. So for example, he's using the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act because he wants to prevent um, bad press, right? So he wants to prevent people from, uh, oh, shoot. Still working. All right, presentation over. Uh, yeah, no, there we are. Because he wants to prevent certain kinds of people from going to their website. So they're just saying, oh, according to the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, if you try to access our server, then you are an intruder, right? Like we, it's, this, is, this is already regulated. You cannot hack a computer. And he's saying, oh, if you visit our website, you are um, an intruder. And it you know, doesn't really matter if that's like 100% the truth. Someone who's trying to write an article on that like if they send them a cease and desist and so forth, that's like not worth it, right? That is not worth it. So you know, I'm not sure if, if I would advocate for that, but it's a very interesting kind of um, way to use way to use the law. And maybe there's something similar in crypto where like I, I'm not a legal expert. He he, he mentioned that in like uh, like one minute of uh, talking, but. Yes. Yes. Oh yeah, he's saying, so again, not legal advice, he's saying that uh, the journalists are not welcome in the terms of conditions, right? Okay, yeah, I mean, uh, if you if you guys wanna know more about Cody Wilson, uh, Alex is, a, is an expert, he actually recommended uh, that. Yeah, again, not legal advice. So, um, yes, however, oh no, wait, so yeah. And, you know, basically the whole idea is like, okay, you know, to be us, you know, let's just 
let's just like let's just build right like why why would we all care about these laws and you know does it really matter that much and you know there's so many ethereum smart contracts which are not regulated but in my view let's make it as difficult as possible for them to get us right like let's really uh be like yeah, let's use let's use these things in order to not get us in trouble right and we have to be very vigilant like we are in a, like you know they want to establish a uh, <laughs> C uh, CBDC, they want to establish a centralized, uh, like a panopticon coin that uh, tracks everything and where anybody can sh be shut off at any time and it just removes um, you know, basically all freedom. So we are on the target, unfortunately. Um, so we have to be extra careful. Like we, we are, you know, we have to be extra careful. That's, you know, that's why we should follow the law. Um, and the government will use anything they can, right? And we can see that with Cody Wilson. Cody Wilson, unfortunately, made a big mistake because he had a, um, uh, Wilson was indicted for se sexual assault after he had a sexual encounter with a minor he met on Sugar Daddy Meat. So yes, a website that matches younger adult women with older men. So, you know, just be careful there. He was accused of committing a second degree felony by uh, paying a 16 year old girl $500 for sex in a hotel room in uh, Austin, Texas, yeah, in August. And of course, you know, you can defend yourself a little bit, but at the end of the day, this is not good, right? So let's avoid that. And I think I found a solution for that. Uh, tactical Jesus, right? So, um, you know, you can just say no to premarital sex, right? <laughs> yes. All right. Um, that's it from me. <laughs> yes. Uh, how much time do we have left? I have no time timer. So, uh, for questions or yeah. So, so what time is it? Okay. Perfect. So uh, we got. So that was like two minutes off target. So that's that's pretty good. So, anybody got any questions? Let's start from here. Can someone get a him a? Uh, do, does, does somebody have a microphone or our fellow friend? Uh, do any uh, fraudulent um, Bcash accepting merchant? Oh, uh, well, on Bcash, the yes. W what's the question? Do any um, fraudulent Bcash accepting merchant, uh, can he empty the card and displaying an over amount? I mean, that's kind of possible since the signature is built on the terminal. Yes, exactly. And there's ways around that. I mean, I made a, like, you know, this is not a presentation on, on Bcash. I made a presentation on that a while ago. And basically the idea would be like that you could whitelist on your own card, certain like kind of merchants or something. Um, if you if you're concerned about fraudulent merchants, generally though, um, a merchant usually does not steal money from you because they're not in the business of stealing money from you. Absolutely. Usually criminals are in the business, and of course, you know, like there's a trade-off, right? Like user experience and uh, you know security, um, and always what you can always do is like you just have a certain allowance in the in the card, right? So this is already okay. like. Absolutely. I mean, it's basically baked into the protocol. Like, you can only spend as much as in the UTXO, and if the merchant is like 100 billion dollars, like the like the blockchain will reject that uh, okay, okay. payment. Therefore, um, yeah, that is that is the situation of the. Um, okay. Okay. Yeah. I hope that okay. answers it. Yeah. Yes. Apparently, we got any questions. So, Yannick Pascal, a couple of questions. So let's do number one first. Does this mean that under any conditions, a business that sells a good or service on its own page and accepts cryptocurrency without intermediaries still falls under FinCEN regulations? Uh, no, no, like they are not because that is explicitly allowed. Basically, you should think about it. Can I use, like, can I replace crypto with cash, right? Because like cash is kind of like like there's no name attached to it. I mean, you know, there's like it's 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 like uh, not tied to a user, versus whereas um, crypto is is kind of the same, right? There's no like you no know, there's an address attached, but like as I established, like it's it's at the end of the day, it's just a um, public key hash or something where it's where that is attached to. 
So uh, if you can accept cash, can you accept cash as merchant? Yes, you can. Therefore, you also can accept um, cryptocurrency. And that is actually why a box works. Like box.digital, they fall into the same thing because they're basically selling you a number, right? They're like, hey, here's a cool signature. Check this out. If they wanted, they could turn it at some point into a haiku. But uh, you know, at the end of the day, it's just a uh, UTXO with a signature. And I think that's a really cool, um, really cool thing that I think we should start uh, imitating more. Yes, and then, so it's, that was the first question. I hope that answers it. Uh, Yannick, I hope that that was good. Um, second of all, what if the merchant uses the note of someone else to broadcast his transaction? Is the note owner of an MSB? Um, no, because you are connecting to the network. Like you are basically like interacting with the blockchain, right? So. Uh, you're broadcasting a transaction. However, if you do what coin payments does, and I, as far as I understand, they take the coins into their um, into their wallet, and then they um, send out the coins into the address that you've specified for them. And that, of course, makes a lot of technical sense because, like, if you have 50 people sending transactions all to the same address, that does not work. So, you know, coin payments generates their own trans uh, its own address for each. Uh, payment and then it sends them to your address of course like we can do way way better than coin payments in my view so coin payments has a lot of issues first of all like we could like just have plugins for like wordpress or something that just does like that just uses a pip 70 payment or something and then like you really you really are uh, exempt yeah so uh yeah i hope hope that answers it and yeah yes Okay, let's get that guy a uh, microphone. Kai. Thanks. So if I understand you correctly, I can sell goods and services for crypto, I can sell goods and services for cash, but I can't exchange cash for crypto peer-to-peer, -peer, right? Yes. So in theory, I meet with Kevin over here. I consult him. I give him 150 bucks. Uh, he consults me. Um, you know, he gives me one Monero. And we just don't invoice each other because we might not have to in the jurisdiction we're in. Is that okay? Uh, not legal advice, but if like, can you can you convince a jury that that is what's going on? Then you know, can you can you convince that 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 that's actually what's happening? And you know, maybe maybe you actually do that. Okay, let's like 30 minutes of timer because you know. But the problem is there, of course, is that then that is income, right? Each of that is income. But if you're only interested, okay, somehow need to get crypto. Uh, then that's good. But if you can somehow tax deduct it, then that works. So again, you you run into these issues here and there where like you um, like you exchange. But then, however, if you then you could probably deduct the taxes again, not legal advice, because you got like you uh, got consulting from him, which is roughly the same amount, right? That's the whole point. So you could be like, oh, this this consulting that I received was so expensive. But yeah, I like in theory that would work. But also like be be aware that. Um, the MS, the uh, uh, FinCEN regulations, they say we enforce these rules strictly. Of course, if you're not in the US, then like it's a little bit more relaxed because like they're not the financial center of the world, right? Like for example, Italy, I, I think it's not the financial center of the world. So therefore, it, or uh, Slovenia, might, so it might be a little easier. But that's the kind of thinking that we kind of need, right? We need to be like, okay, like how can we, how can we do this? We need to go the Uber route. Like Uber is um, a very big company a multi-billion dollar company, they serve a need that people actually need. Um, and they do it in a way where they are not like, you know, you can get people from A to B without having to obtain a taxi license. Yes. All right. So I... we got another question. No, no question. <laughs> oh, uh, Yes, because if you like, if you don't want to be, <laughs> well, the the idea is basically if you want to avoid going to jail for sex crimes, then just wait until you're married. You know. Yeah, because you can't marry a minor, right? So like, they'll stop you in a track. They're like, hold a second, there. You want to marry this person? This doesn't work, right? So it's just like a. Yeah, you know, like logical argument. But yeah, excellent question, excellent question. But you know, I'm not a, a marriage, I'm not a pastor or something, so I, I can't say too much about uh, marriage and the laws behind that. But yeah, yes, uh, 
more, one, one more question, yes. Uh, I'll, yeah, let's get the uh, question here first. Uh, so, um, as I understood the Uber situation, uh, is I don't think it worked for them because they found some legal loophole, but because they got very big, very fast, and it was basically, people got used to it, and it's kind of hard for the regulators to say, okay, this is illegal when everyone is already doing it. Uh, you can try, of course, that's, uh, they tried with the war on drugs, right? But uh, it's a, there's a losing battle. Yes, I actually 100% agree. I think I should have put that into the presentation, maybe cut out some of the loss, but that is exactly what I, um, I should be talking about is that if we do those things that are like technically legal, right? Like uh, as I explained, you know, running a wallet, sending sending transactions, giving some people consulting, all of that uh, for crypto, that is all legal. And if we go the Uber route, where you just like do these things and we just grow really, really quickly, people will become dependent and like, hey, you know, I really want to use that kind of service, um, especially if there's no alternative, right? Like. That's why we have to kind of find a killer app for these things. So yes, I 100% agree. And uh, but we're, um, I mean, like you, you probably do, don't even disagree. But just to clarify, like uh, what Uber did was legal, right? Like they were not breaking any laws. They were uh, following the rules. And while following the rules, they just became so big that the regulators, it would just look really, really bad if they were like. Oh no! Actually, uh, Uber. This is um, I'm not sure exact timeline, but in uh, in Germany, Uber is like a taxi business. Like you have to have a taxi license to do that. Hmm. Exactly. Right sharing, yeah. So, I mean, and this is why I kind of like made this, you know, a little bit tongue in cheek, uh, but not really quite tongue in cheek, a slide with like, you know, owning crypto versus controlling crypto and you're holding crypto versus holding crypto hostage um, because these words matter. Like, it really matters which words we use. And I think that's one of the reasons why uh, Bitcoin mining, I think you could really make a strong argument that Bitcoin mining is not money transmission, it's not payments regulated and so forth, because we don't use any of these terms. We are using the term mining, which is a, you know, it's from, from industry, right? Like, so therefore we kind of implicitly, and it looks very much like, uh, like industry, right? And therefore we don't fall under these uh, terms. Yes, let me get one of the online questions. So we got, uh, yes, Ethan, given the potential for overreaching governments to take subjective actions against developers for just writing software, have you ever considered going anon? What's the backup plan for Chronic and Riper if you get picked up on your way out of Prague? Well, uh, if if they do pick me up and I'm in the uh, like like car, or the, the police car, then I will go anonymous. Yes, that's my plan. No. Um, <laughs> so... Um, I mean, I have considered uh, going Anon, but I think there's a power, and of course, this goes a little bit uh, farther. In my view, it is it increases my power, if like my influence, my you know the, my leverage, if I don't go anonymous, because we can still operate in the uh, legal territory. Also, once they actually start banning this, these things, then of course they have to reevaluate, right? If they're like, oh, now actually Bitcoin mining, that is uh, just f fully illegal or something, which I don't expect them to do. At the end of the day, like, you know, these are laws are very fuzzy things, right? They're like very uh, up to interpretation. That's, that's why like the Uber thing works. That's also, you know, like this is a very, very like uh, non-direct thing. And also like there's politics involved and everything. And uh, and most importantly, incentives. I think there's like a very very large group of people who are, have a high high incentive for uh, Bitcoin to still be around, and they will make sure that these regulations at least in exclude them, right? And you know those are uh, miners. And you know, let's see let's see where that will go. That microphone is very scratchy. Yeah, throw them. Uh, number three will be the opt in nature of coin mixing protocols like cash differentiating from legal. Okay. 
Yes, I don't know. Like Ethan, that's an excellent question. Um, they still might be like, yeah, well, technically, technically you aren't that, but like what you're actually doing is you are uh, money laundering. Um, however, I think if you use um, cash fusion to pay for payments directly, so when you uh, when the output goes to a merchant, um, then I think uh, like I think that is actually explicitly exempt. Like you can go through the you can go through the law. I could I could pull it up. I could pull it up, and and it's pretty it's pretty uh, clear. Maybe you can do that. Actually, is that possible? Um, where is that? Here. So that's the that's the file, and we are. Yeah, so they they just go through and define like different things. So we got wallets, we got the ATMs, we got the apps, and here we are. So this is an anonymizing service provider. It's a money uh, transmission business. However, we scroll further and boom, anonymizing services provider. And there we go. An anonymizing service provider is not a money transmitter. And um, and here, by contrast, a person that utilizes the software to to anonymize the person's own transactions will either be a user or a money transmitter, depending on the purpose of each transaction. For example, a user uh, would employ the software in paying for goods and services on its own behalf, uh, while a money transmitter would use it to engage as a business in acceptance and, and transmission of value as a transmitter or intermediary financial institution. So here we can see, like, it's, you know, I would say that's pretty explicit. A user would employ the you know, cash fusion when paying for goods and services on on. I would say there, but it's on behalf. It's a user, it, but, you know, whatever. Maybe machines can also be users. Yes, I think that answers it. And let's go back here. And Ethan. Yeah, there's no more question. Maybe someone else has a question. Please go ahead. Is that a question or just hair? That's just hair fixing. Yeah. Yes. Change the word of something. And you're trying to fight based on that. Like, I, I know that laws be... laws are definitely like the laws are written in words, and if you are outside of those words, it is much it gives you some leeway. Like if you if you do something in exactly the words that the law says, you are in the wrong. Uh, but I I don't know how I feel about just changing the words. It's like sort of like you have to find more way to an anonymized stuff than just that. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Like this this is not how it works. Obviously, you can't just say oh. I a quark now and therefore I'm I'm not a money transmitter like that is not how it works however we have like with Bitcoin we had like this chance and I think for some things it was really like with the mining for example like we just said no this is mining right this is just like digging gold out of out of a hole and that is very very different regulated than other things and uh, there it really mattered like if we call that oh this is payment processing right like run this payment processing service then i think it would be very very different but you but, don't you don't think that's because they don't choose where stuff like they the miners to some extent have control over what they they mine but but to, they don't know who they're mining it for uh so basically like they're trying to win so that they win the mining reward they're not they don't care about the transactions like that's exactly. not really a, that's not the goal of what they're there for yeah exactly exactly like that's like they're they're just assembling they're just throwing stuff into a bucket and putting like a timestamp on it and of course the hash solution yeah. um so you know like i think there's a like but but it, it helps right like if we call bitcoin mining bitcoin mining instead of bitcoin payment processing yeah. then um it's much cleaner, right? It's much easier to convince a jury. Of course, if there's already an established term, right? Like for example, uh, you know, virtual currency or like crypto asset, that's an established term, right? Like it's used all the time and we can't get rid of it anymore, except if you like, you know, just chip, keep chipping away at the culture, right? But I don't think, I, I think the, the train there for is, is gone for that. So we can't do that anymore. Um, yeah, however, whenever we discover something new, right? It's like, oh, like that isn't named yet then like be careful how you name it right like don't because like there's this like corruption i guess where like oh let me name it after something that i already know so other users will understand it more easily and that of course is great for marketing right you can be like you know like oh this is just like the bcash is just like an account right like it is an account but like there's a certain problem there because like account is actually like a more or less a legal term right it it gets uh, much easier there if you just like if you call it differently and uh, you know the votes are still out for that um then you have a much better uh case in the court yeah yes uh yeah i think we have we have some more time for questions yeah, please uh, go ahead so um 
I uh, see that the, you can make an opposite case also that uh, you should name things uh, according to something that already exists. Uh, and not just some random thing that already exists, but something that like fundamentally is the same thing. Uh, yeah. Because uh, if, if you try to play the, the legal wordplay, like for instance, people tried this with uh, uh, saying Bitcoin is a commodity, a digital gold, because they didn't want to get it regulated as securities. So they invented this story and the narrative that it's the digital gold, but uh, this is not truly really representing what Bitcoin is. So uh, on, it causes problem in the on the internal side in the Bitcoin community. It solves the problem on the external side. The regulators uh, uh, don't go after us, but on the internal side, uh, then let's say then we have a fork in the Bitcoin. So and uh, the narrative that Bitcoin is digital gold prevents people to understand what the fork is and how can it happen? Because then you have suddenly two versions of gold. This, this does like one of them is obviously fake, mm. right? One, one is the true gold and one is fake mm. because you cannot have two versions of gold. Um, so I'm, it's uh, something for something. Uh, I feel like. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yes. So actually, I, I agree with your point. Like we should pick, and I think that's what they did with Bitcoin mining, right? They picked something that already exists, right? which is gold mining, and they named it after that, which is something else, right? So um, if you discover something new, uh, name it after something that already exists, but which is something that closely resembles that. Uh, also, I'm not an expert in um, securities laws. And uh, like apparently now the SEC wants to classify uh, even Bitcoin as a security. Um, and, you know, we, we never know if uh, they could make the case for that. But um, yeah, uh, it, it'll be it'll be interesting. So we, we just have to. Um, and again, this is also like a cultural thing where if there's like a huge, huge, like, like, I guess, dollar sign on Bitcoin not being a security, right, if like there's a lot of uh, money on there and uh, especially like a, a little bit in the government then it's going to take like really really long for bitcoin to become a security and uh yeah and we have to keep those we have to keep that in mind so you know that's why we should be focused on entrepreneurship because we have to grow the system um similar to uber because otherwise it really doesn't matter what we think like we can play the best games whatever the regulators will be quicker than us and they will just um, play their game which is slow and steady and quite uh, forceful yeah. yeah and and maybe at some point um, crypto will actually be like very very highly strictly regulated where you basically can't use it anymore legally and of course then we probably have to change tactics somehow but right now as I showed there's a lot of uh, free space like a lot of empty space that we can fill and um, Let's use that while we can. Right? Like it, it will probably take like a decade or so until um, those laws are like really, really uh, oppressive. Yeah, maybe we need to develop two different languages. One uh, set of terminology that we use when we're speaking on record and when we're speaking to the regulators, and then another set of terms that we use off record that more closely represent what the things actually are. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, uh, let me check if there's some online questions. Um, yes, we are out of time, but um, Rose said that uh, you can chat at a table. So, um, but I think we got the panel now. Yes. Um, on crypto adoption, but maybe we can take like a, a five, ten minute break or something. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. So we take a short break. Um,